Hello, thank you um, for joining us for the Advancing Racial Equity in Career and Technical Education Examples from the Field webinar. Um, my name is AJ Welton and my co-facilitators are Francina Turner and Devin Owens. And Angel Velez is also a co-facilitator, but he was unable to join us today, but he helped um, put together this webinar. So the purpose of this webinar is to learn from educational leaders who are increasing opportunities for and ensuring the success of racially minoritized groups in CTE. And you will hear from panelists who are experts on how to advance racial equity in CTE. And we have, we have an outstanding lineup as panelists today. Um, like I said, our outstanding lineup is um, Amanda Berkson Shilcock, who is senior fellow from the National Skills Coalition. And Amanda, as senior fellow at the National Skills Coalition, where she leads the NSC's work on adult education and workforce policies that support US born and immigrant adults with foundational skills gaps. In this role, she analyzes policies, makes recommendations, and coordinates with National Skills Coalition member organizations to address issues facing adult learners and job seekers, including immigrant workers. Amanda has authored numerous publications and policy recommendations on immigrant integration, workforce development, and adult education. She has extensive experience engaging state and federal policymakers, and Amanda joined um, the National Skills Coalition in 2015. Amanda holds a bachelor's degree Amanda holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania where she studied American civilization with an emphasis on minority populations. And then our second um, panelist is Dr. Melissa N. Gonzalez, um, who is president at Houston Community College Southeast. Dr. Gonzalez um, holds a bachelor's degree in business administration, an MBA, and a doctorate in international business management from the University of Texas Pan American. And Dr. G um, Gonzalez, I'm a fellow Texan. <laughs> Prior to her current role, uh, Dr. Gonzalez was the Chief of Staff for HCC um, Chancellor Cesar Maldonado, Vice Chancellor Workforce and e Economic Development at Lone Star College and Associate Professor of Management at the University of Houston Clear Lake. While a professor, Dr. Gonzalez pursued basic and applied research in the areas of cross-cultural management, management education, ma maquilladores in Mexico, and Hispanic career paths. Her articles have been accepted for presentation and are publication at over 30 regional, national, international conferences. And Dr. Gonzalez plays an active role in the community, serving on numerous boards and committees. And finally, we have Daia Thompson Phillips, who is the Executive Director of Work for Workforce Equity at Olive Harvey College um, here in Chicago. Um, she served as the Director of Strategy for City Colleges of Chicago, where she oversaw the offices, Office of Strategy and Research at Malcolm X College. She was responsible for performance and st strategic growth for the college through a merger acquisition of the healthcare school. Further, she also led initiatives that helped Malcolm X College meet its annual goals, as well as increase institutional data literacy. She served as a strategic advisor to the president and the, and, the district, and the district office executive team on planning, budgeting, and operational improvement. She has a master's degree in education and administration from Loyola University and a bachelor's degree in political science from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Daia is now the executive director, as I said before, um, of workforce equity at Olive Harvey College. And um, we have more information about our wonderful panelists that will be posted on our website. Um, along with the um, recording of this webinar. So thank you to our panelists and we look forward to um, learning more about your work. So the overall agenda of this um, webinar is um, first, I'm gonna speak briefly, briefly about the Office of Community College Research and Leadership's um, mission. Um, as part of our CT equity um, series, we've been talking about and um, defining racial equity for quite some time. So we're gonna talk about briefly how the center um, defines racial equity. 
And then finally, we're going to hear from our three panelists. They're each gonna provide a presentation where they share exemplars from the field. And then um, we're, we ourselves from OCCRL are gonna ask the panelists some questions. And then um, if there's time, we'll give you as participants opportunities to um, ask questions via the chat function. So the Office of Community College Research um, and Leadership, mission, our mission is to um, research and study policies, programs, and practices designed to enhance outcomes for diverse youth and adults who seek to transition to and through college to employment. And although um, equity-driven change is one of our four um, major pillars of our work, we really do um, consider equity to be center to our work. So I think this, this pillar should be at the center of this visual you see here. Um, other areas um, are public engagement. Um, we do professional development. Um, transformative leadership. Leadership is part of um, the title of our research shop. So we just don't do research. We also um, develop leaders. And then even though community college is, is part of our title of our research center, um, we focus on comprehensive P20 educational pathways. And so next I'll turn it over to Francina, who is going to just briefly, since this webinar is all about um, racial equity and CTE, um, she's gonna spend some time defining how we at OCCRL um, define uh, racial equity. Good afternoon. So I want to start with how we look at racial equity. So Musius Ledesma and Parker define racial equity as the degree to which racially equitable systems that uplift and increase access and opportunity for historically minoritized people of color are ingrained into every level of an institution's practices, policies, and structures. Uh, these changes must occur at every level in order to counter the implicit and explicit racism that's already ingrained into every level of an institution's practices, policies, and structures. We also acknowledge that finding these inequities can be difficult due to the ways in which we might replace the term race with other terms that we deem maybe less divisive or painful to discuss. So we might substitute black with urban. Um, that's one of the best examples I could come up with. And so it becomes a little bit easier to see inequities when we replace blaming students <clears throat> with institutional introspection. So when we're being introspective, we wouldn't look at inequities between racial groups as achievement gaps. We would say and mean that we're pursuing an equity agenda as we examine the ways our policies and procedures directly and indirectly affect students' outcomes with race as an analytic. So, um, in a nutshell, the term achievement gap is problematic. We prefer the term opportunity gap because it refocuses our attention to looking inward as institutions. So instead of seeing our students through lenses of deficiency, we choose to invest our time and resources examining how we work or don't work to ensure our students are successful. Thank you, Francina. Um, and now we're going to hear from our three panelists who have each um, prepared a uh, brief presentation to talk about the work that they're doing in the field in relation to uh, CTE and racial equity. So first we're gonna hear from Amanda Berkson Chilcock who is senior fellow at the National Skills Coalition. Give me a moment. Okay, Amanda. <laughs> Turning over to you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, uh, I appreciate that, Anjali, and thanks for uh, 
having gotten the slides set up here. Um, I've turned on my camera briefly just so you can all uh, see me because I think it's always nice to know who you're talking to on a webinar when we're not in the same room together. And um, I'm coming to you today from Washington, D.C., where my organization is based. I do want to be respectful of my co-presenters' time, um, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through the slides that I have to share with you, but I do want to um, uh, mention that at the last slide of my presentation, which I'm not going to walk through in depth, um, I have a link to further information on each example that I'm sharing. So if there's something you want to dig deeper into, you will be able to access the slides after today's presentation, and you will be able to click on those links and get more information. So uh, National Skills Coalition is a policy organization. We do not run any um, programs or services ourselves, um, but we have 28,000 members across the country, and they include workforce boards, community colleges, career and technical education programs uh, it, that are housed in school districts and other locations, community-based nonprofit organizations, labor unions, labor management partnerships, businesses, industry associations, really anyone who has an interest in workforce training. And what I wanted to share with you today were a couple of examples from uh, the, the folks we work with on the ground, as well as uh, sort of the larger thinking that we've done around these related issues. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide here. And I was so appreciative of our colleagues' um, introduction to this webinar that you know, public policies have created a, a played a role in creating the racial inequities we see, and therefore public policies really have to be an important part of the solution. So uh, we're going to move on now to the next slide. Obviously, um, you know, this goes without saying, but I think it's important to emphasize ethnic and racial diversity is a strength of the U.S. workforce for a couple of reasons. One, because we want everybody to have equitable opportunities to contribute, and two, because the research is actually pretty clear that diverse teams um, are actually more productive and lead to higher returns on investment um, than non-diverse teams. So there's data, hard data, to back things up. And yet, we know that people of color um, in the U.S. face significant inequities. This chart comes from PolicyLink um, and their equity atlas. And essentially, it highlights um, who in the U.S. has at least a two-year degree, that is an associate's degree. And as you can see, there are pretty broad differences in different race and ethnic categories uh, across that. And 43% of the jobs in the United States uh, require an associate's degree or higher. Uh, there are other jobs that require post-secondary credentials, but we won't get into those details in the time that we have today. So those disparities have heavy costs for people and their families and communities. And as you'll see in the next slide, they also have significant disparities for uh, the economies in which people are living. Right? So there are 52% uh, of, of jobs in the U.S. labor market require some form of training past high school, whether that is a two-year degree, a four-year degree, an apprenticeship certificate, or some other uh, degree. And that is the largest chunk of our economy, and yet there's not enough workers trained to meet that uh, skill level. So in the next slide, um, you'll see you know, that, that we've identified that there's a need for additional education and workforce policies to advance equity. Um, and so we worked with a group of National Skills Coalition members over the last year and a half uh, to put together a brand new report called the Roadmap to Racial Equity in Workforce Development, which you'll see highlighted in the next slide. And that report is available on our website and includes a, a range of recommendations, not limited to career and technical education, but I will be focusing today on the pieces most relevant to CTE. Next slide. Um, so the three pieces I want to briefly talk about today, improving on-ramps in the post-secondary CTE for adults of color, making full use of your data, and ensuring that students have equitable access to supportive services. Um, I, the first piece um, is really around not assuming that everybody who goes into post-secondary CTE is going to be coming from a high school program, right? There's often an assumption that you've made two years. Um, yeah, we can go on to the next slide. You've completed two years at the high school level, and now you're going to go segue effortlessly into your two years at the post-secondary level. But 
particularly if we're concerned about racial equity, we need to make sure there are on-ramps for students who are not coming directly from high school. So there's a great example from down in El Paso, Texas, the Socorro Independent School District adult education program serving adults who were in English language classes or GED high school equivalency classes um, created a partnership with their high school CTE program. They hired the high school CTE teachers to work overtime in the evening to work with adult learners. It was a terrific way to ensure that adults, um, in this case because of El Paso's location on the border, overwhelmingly Latino adults had access to high quality CTE opportunities. The next example in the next slide uh, comes from Kansas. We recognize that because of structural racism and other impacts in this country, uh, people of color are disproportionately incarcerated, right? And so one example of identifying opportunities to reach adult students where they are is sometimes they're incarcerated. There's a really interesting example in Topeka, Kansas of a program that enabled incarcerated women to participate in an integrated education and training program uh, that would allow them to become certified production technicians. The next example uh, comes from uh, one more that I want to share from New York, um, focusing in particular on immigrants who come to the U.S. with credentials from their home country but are stuck in low-wage jobs here in the U.S. Career and technical education can be a really important uh, opportunity for these folks. You could imagine somebody who might have been, let's say, uh, a nurse in their home country or an engineer in their home country, and they're retraining in the U.S. Maybe they're going to become a nurse or an engineer, or more likely in the short term, because they need to earn money, they might do a phlebotomy training course, or they might do a, an electronic technician training course. Um, and so LaGuardia Community College has a really innovative program uh, that they've used to do that. The next set of examples have to do with data, right? And so disaggregating outcome data can help you identify bottlenecks in the system. That means places where your students of color might be getting stuck or might be falling out of the pipeline, or springboards, which is to say programs or uh, geographic areas in your, um, in your region where they're doing especially well at serving students of color. Minnesota um, has done this really interestingly with a whole suite of publicly funded workforce programs, not limited to CTE. They passed legislation a few years ago requiring the program outcome to be disaggregated by race and ethnicity. So it doesn't just tell you this program graduated uh, 27 individuals, it says this was the graduation rate for African American, white, et cetera. And they didn't just use white, black, Latino, Asian category, they actually disaggregated into other major groups that are well represented in Minnesota, like Hmong immigrants, Somali immigrants, and American Indians. Um, in the next slide, you'll see uh, that setting racial equity goals, either as part of your state Perkins Career and Technical Education Plan, if that's something you're involved in, or as something that's in your local program can be an important element of creating a data-driven decision-making culture. It's definitely not the only element. And the last piece I wanted to talk about today was supportive services. The things like childcare and transportation often make the difference in whether a person can succeed and complete a community college or a career and technical education program and so a really interesting example comes from Arkansas. A range of programs at the community college um, and many of those students were students of color. Notably, uh, the program has been so successful that actually participants in it are more successful than run-of-the-mill community college students um, who are just sort of walking in the front door of the college and enrolling in classes. So that was a quick, quick tour through a handful of examples. Um, as mentioned, uh, you know, these are important sort of big picture goals to be working towards. Uh, I have two last slides here and then I'll turn it back over to my colleagues. Um, so we recognize, of course, that career and technical education and workforce development are not the only answer to fixing structural racism, right? That would be foolish and really short-sighted of us. 
but we do see them as a crucial puzzle piece. Um, and I think it's very important to be thinking about them as part of the solution. I put my contact information in the next slide. You can follow up with me. Again, you'll have access to these slides after today's webinar. And the last slide, um, I won't talk you through it, but you'll see that I have resources linking to more details on each of the examples I shared. Thank you so much for sticking with me through what I know was a very speedy presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Anjali now so that she can introduce our next presenter. Thank you so much, Amanda. Those were excellent, um, really detailed um, examples. I appreciate that. And just be patient with me as I switch out <laughs> the screen. Okay, so next we have um, Dr. Melissa Gonzalez, president of Houston Community College Southeast. I'm going to um, unmute you, Dr. Gonzalez. Hello? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank, oh, thank you so much. Again, uh, my name is Melissa Gonzalez. Again, a great uh, pleasure to be here and to share some information regarding HEC uh, overall and also HEC Southeast, which where I'm the president. Um, I wanted to share um, some information so, uh, I'm sorry, do, um, do I'm going to yeah. advance your slides for you. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you can go. <laughs> um, so, I wanted to show you just a little bit of Houston Community College. Um, we are about over 106,000. This was, again, 18. This is annual enrollment for. Uh, we have six colleges, but we teach at about over 23 locations in the Houston area, but also we cover about a couple of counties, Harris County being the biggest county in Houston, I mean in Texas, as well as Fort Bend uh, County. And as you can see from our demographics, uh, we're very diverse. And uh, we are number one as far as international students enrolling at uh, our college. And so we're very excited about having to, having a, a lot of diversity at our colleges. The next slide will show you specifically on HEC Southeast, where I am the president. We have enrollment of about um, maybe 12,000 a year. Um, we have two campuses under the Eastside umbrella and then all the programs that we have. Uh, we have centers of excellence throughout the region and we are housed, uh, we house the Business and Logistics Center of Excellence as well as our Material Science and Welding and we have all these other programs as well. I also wanted to show you Southeast, um, the area that we serve. As, as far as our population, the household income, our area, uh, we do serve about 70% Hispanic students. And uh, as you can see from the information, the data, uh, a lot of individuals are either have no high school or they have a high school graduation. Um, I also wanted to show you the schools that we serve. Again, every of our college serves certain high schools, and these are from Houston ISD, which is, again, one of the largest independent school districts in the state. And, and they're ranked, or I should say that they're rated through a, uh, a third party. And our schools that we serve, uh, again, a lot of minority schools are ranked either Ds, D-minus, or Fs. 
So this is our community. This is who we are serving. This is who we're trying to uh, help and trying to uh, bring opportunities to the individuals that we serve, uh, especially our community. Uh, we also have charter schools and other smaller schools, but this, these are, I call them the big four. So um, I've been the president for about a year, well, officially it'll be a year in April. Uh, before that, I was an interim for about nine months. And um, what I did, the first thing was just to go out in the community. I knew I'm uh, originally from South Texas, way down South Texas. And so I grew up in a community just like this, uh, where I serve as a president. And I found out a lot of things that um, really opened my eyes to make sure that we have opportunities for the communities that we serve. And mostly, like I said, low income, mostly Hispanic, uh, uh, individuals of color. We have a, a, a also a growing African-American uh, student base as well. And so I just want to share some of the things we're doing to um, promote opportunities in the community. And it started with just conversations, having conversations with the community. One of the first things that I heard from the community is that we don't have time. We don't have time to take classes. We don't have time uh, throughout the, um, you know, we don't have time to be uh, taking, you know, semester after semester. We don't have money to be doing that. So we're looking for opportunities that we can get some certificates, we can get some jobs, and we can start working. And so one of the first ones that um, were, uh, we implemented was a two-day short-term certificate for forklift training, and it also includes an OSHA credential. Uh, two days, $170. Uh, the student leaves with a certificate, not just from HCC, but also a OSHA credential of forklift safety that is good for three years. And so students are able to get a credential, start working. We have a wraparound services at the college where we provide, um, we provide uh, training, um, skills training as far as uh, actually working on a forklift, but also uh, we provide um, resources to help them have a professional resume. We also help, help them do interview skills. We have workshops provided for them. And also we have partnerships with dress dress for success and career gear. So if they don't have any clothes for interviews, we will provide that as well. So partnering with our um, community-based organizations in the neighborhood will also helps us to make sure that we provide everything we can for our community. And so this two-day short-term certificate is offered two days throughout the week and also on the weekends. Then the, what we also heard uh, was uh, that we only have um, you know, what if I want to, you know, take some classes and then, then pursue my associate degree, but I also want to learn skills. Okay, so we started this take one and done program where they, they receive and earn a, a level one certificate um, that um, in a program that is high demand and, and they're able to get some skills. It's a credit program. So these, this is a, we call it a stackable credential. They can finish one of these in one semester, 16 weeks. They do have to enroll full time, but this will allow them to earn an associate degree if they choose to continue. Um, so we're very excited that we have uh, programs in real estate, in welding, in logistics, in payroll, uh, payroll specialists, and also um, construction. So individuals who take these classes either day or night, we have a day track and an evening track, they will finish in one semester. Um, this past fall semester, we had 31 students in welding that earned their credentials, earned their level one certificate in just one semester. Uh, we had uh, over 50 total uh, this fall semester, but 31 came from the welding department, so we're very excited about that. Um, the next one is also, there's some individuals say, well, I don't have a high school diploma, but I also wanna learn skills. Our, our change your life for $20. Um, this is where a student, an individual can be learn, earning their GED or high school equivalency, plus be enrolled in a career track. And you see we have a Construction Management Academy, the Business Technology Academy, Information Technology Academy, the Healthcare Academy, or the Transportation Academy, all for $20. So um, we received a grant to do this, and uh, we have a lot of individuals who are earning their GED as well as Earning, learning some new skills. So um, the plan is as they finish their GED, they're also finishing their skills training 
And again, the idea is that it's only $20, but it's a commitment where they have to be a full-time student as well. Um, another thing that we're doing to, again, minimize the gap and to help individuals transition from school to the workplace is all our welding students at all our HEC campuses, not just East Side, not just Southeast, but we are providing them some uniform shirts. Um, they are, we're trying to help them with the soft skills in, and also preparing for students to be ready for the workforce. Uh, when employers come and tour our facilities, they see our students with, um, a, a, you know, a, a professional looking, and uh, so the students are transitioning well into the expectations of what the employer needs. And those are another things that I learned as I was visiting with employers as well, that um, we, we were hearing that our students, whether while they were trained, did not have the soft skills um, to complete the, the overall student, um, as far as the employee, I should say, the overall excellent employee that they're looking for. So we help with that. This is our second semester doing that. It's very, very successful students. We provide them with one shirt. The rest of the shirts, if they wanna buy more, they are able to use their financial aid to buy them from the bookstore. Another program that we have that um, we're very excited about is that we partnered with a, um, with a construction company, Merrick Construction, and uh, we're doing a pre-apprenticeship program with high school students. So our high school students, we have uh, 20 students from two of those high schools that are uh, being challenged right now with uh, being successful. Uh, Austin and Milby High Schools, we have 20 students where the very first semester was last semester and we had a commitment signing. This was a, a picture of them. Um, you know, the idea that these students, they start off as juniors taking classes. Uh, they are bused to the campus where they do construction. They will be finishing their uh, when they finish their senior year, they will have a, a level one certificate in construction management, plus they will have a job with Merit Construction. Um, they'll be doing some summer uh, apprenticeship during this summer, but they will have a job to um, continue with uh, once they finish. And also, if they choose to, the construction company wants to work with us. So if the student wants to continue to receive an associate degree, they will work with their schedule to allow them to take classes and work at the same time. But these are high school students, but by the time they graduate, they will have a job uh, with Merit Construction, a full-time job with Merit Construction. So this allows students from our community to uh, be engaged in some training, but also be assured that they will have a job at the end of, the, of their two years of, the, uh, of, of high school. Um, I also wanted to sh uh, share with you that our community, they're working. They work a lot, and a lot of them are working at the refinery. We are really close to the Port of Houston, um, and so we have started offering some welding classes fall semester of last semester that started 10 o'clock at night. And uh, we just did it as a pilot, and we had 11 students. The classes were very successful. So this semester, the spring semester, we're offering, uh, we're also including pipe fitting and sheet metal. So 10 o'clock at night to one o'clock in the morning, um, we do offer some classes there um, to help the community, as you know, the communities that uh, need to work, but also see an opportunity, see the need to get some credentials behind their skills. And um, so they'll be earning a, a level one certificate, which, um, which, um, which hopefully they'll lead to an associate degree, again, if they choose to. A lot of the, our employers, are, are seeking supervisors for welders or supervisors for the payroll specialists. And so we do have associate degrees that uh, are stackable after the level one certificate. So um, another thing, as far as the late night evening classes, we're, um, since we have students late at night, we're looking at uh, getting advisors as well, late at night and other resources that we provide day students. The same thing with the late evening, we're, um, we're very excited that this is, this started out at, at the campus where I'm at, and so we're trying to uh, push it at other locations throughout the Houston region. Um, other things that we're doing um, at our Southeast, again, we're trying to promote science and STEM. Uh, so we have this new gaming certificate at one of our campuses. We saw the need to have a pathway for our welding students. Um, so we have a new AAS in welding. 
an associate degree in welding. We have virtual labs, reality labs, again, just so that students are more engaged and, and see opportunities uh, of technology. We're establishing also a minority male initiative resource center that should be uh, online, um, not online, that should be uh, open by after spring break. Um, and so we noticed that a lot of the students, uh, especially the minority males, um, our numbers had been decreasing throughout the whole system. And so we want to make sure they have a space that uh, they can come and discuss and talk and chat and just feel where they can have uh, be comfortable to sharing some of the challenges that they're having. Um, we're having a lot of sessions with um, through our counselors um, regarding um, mental health awareness, not just during mental health month, but to, but uh, throughout the whole year. And so we're going to use a lot of those discussions. Uh, um, in this Minority uh, Male Initiatives Resource Center. We're also having advisors inside the high schools. We have some already. We have some uh, high schools already with advisors, and we're going to have more advisors. And um, we're also working with our, um, we, we also have an engineering focus as well that we're starting an academy with our four-year partnership with the University of Houston. We realized uh, that the college is very intimidating a lot of com our community is not uh, is intimidated. And I'll just share a quick story. Uh, my very first, uh, once I earned my PhD, I was a professor at UH Clear Lake. I invited my parents, um, who the most they got was a GED, which uh, I thank God for that. Um, they, I wanted to show them my new office and um, at, the, at the university, and they were just so embarrassed. They did not want to come. And I, I, I finally they did come, but it was late at night. Uh, I think it was like 10 o'clock at night um, that they came over to see my office. So that's the that's the culture. Uh, a lot of our parents are not, you know, they're not they they don't know. Not that they don't want their children to go to uh, the college. They just don't know where to go, how to go. And um, again, their focus is just to make sure that they um, that that they have the, you know, again, high school is a, a big achievement, but they need resources, they need help financially. Um, we partner up a lot with our community-based organizations. Our community is very comfortable going to our community-based organizations, and here are just some of them that we work with. I'm just gonna highlight the Houston Food Bank. We have a mobile food uh, truck that comes twice a month, and students and the community members are invited to come and receive 60 pounds of food twice a month. Um, the, the first time they came earlier this year, um, it was raining and cold. Uh, we're not used to that in Houston. And so we were thinking that it was not going to be a good turnout. We had over 80 students that came. Um, and some of them were community members. Um, there is a need of food as, as well. Um, there's housing issues. And so, again, when we work with our community-based organizations, we help with uh, some of the resources that we cannot provide, but also we help, we are engaged with their uh, population and the visitors that they have so that, that we can show them that we have programs from two-day programs all the way to um, working with uh, getting your associate degree and transferring to a four-year university. So we are, uh, again, these are just some of them that we work with. We work with so many because we realize uh, at Southeast that our community-based organizations, people do attend. A lot of our students come from the community-based organizations where they transition. We help the transition be smooth from them to us at HCC Southeast. Um, I also wanted to share with you that uh, we have job fairs, regular job fairs. This is one that we're partnering with one of the elected officials. We're very connected with elected officials too because they have a constitu constituency base. And we're having a um, job fair, Yo Necesito Trabajar, or Yo Necesito Trabajo, I Need a Job. Uh, very simple, very, you know, that's what it is. And it is open up to the community. Uh, we, are, we are a community college. We are there to provide resources and connections and opportunities. Uh, we understand our community. We understand that we have over 70% of, you know, individuals of color that are low income and uh, need to know what we offer. And so uh, I, I see it as a responsibility for us. I see uh, that it, it is really needed in our community to be more engaged with what they need. Uh, teaching classes on Sundays, we have bilingual classes in Spanish. Um, 
and um, in welding and, and, and also in HVAC uh, air conditioning. And, um, you know, and it's Sunday may not be popular for some uh, folks, but we have instructors that, and, and of course administration that believes that we need to provide a classes when the student wants it and not when, when the, you know, most of us want to take class, uh, want to offer those classes. So it's been a cultural shift and mindset shift for the whole uh, Southeast uh, college where we need to be serving our students, we need to be serving our community. Um, again, these are just some of the highlights of some of the great things we're doing to uh, equalize uh, and make uh, education accessible to all. Uh, I want to share my contact information. My name is Melissa Gonzalez. Um, that's my office number, my email. Um, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share these amazing things that we're doing and making a difference in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, we really love to hear the high school students. Um, not a guaranteed job. <laughs> Once yes. <they're> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, next, we're going to hear from um, Daia Thompson uh, Phillips with all of Harvey College. And I am going to pull up uh, Daia's slides. So just be patient with me. Great. I think you'll also find um, a lot of themes in our best practices talked about um, in Amanda's and Dr. Gonzalez's. So it's really exciting to see um, the alignment that's happening across the country. Yeah, it is. You're right. That is something positive to see. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into one specific CTE area. And this is about how what we're doing right now in building equity and inclusion within the cannabis industry. So a little bit about all of Harvey. We are a public two year individually HLC accredited community college in Chicago. Um, we are part of the City Colleges of Chicago system. We're one of seven, um, which is one of the largest systems in Illinois and across the nation. Um, we serve in a hardship index area in the far southeast side. Some people might think it's Indiana. We're not. We're still in Illinois. And um, our focus area is transportation, distribution, and logistics. Um, if you look at the map to the right, you can see the darker the red tones, orange tones are, the higher the hardship in index. And um, I'd like to express that in that um, in some of our service areas, we have some of the depressed, the most depressed areas in the city. Um, we have a food desert, an employment desert, um, but we have a really great community um, and individuals who come to the campus, they're really seeking for improvement in quality of life um, and to level up on their education and employment. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the demographics, what our, what our CCC system looks like and then what does all of Harvey look like? So district-wide, we have roughly 76% of our uh, registered students are black, black and brown. And then for all of Harvey, 91% of those students are black, are either black or brown. So um, at the district level, roughly 50% of our students across all seven city colleges um, are Latino. Um, and then 28%, um, roughly 28% are black. Um, at Olive Harvey, it's kind of inverse. 68% <laughs> um, are African American and 24% are Latino. Next slide. So our focus, as I mentioned, um, is around transportation, distribution, and logistics. Um, uh, so for our Olive Harvey, so you can get an indication of what we look like as compared to the district. Um, uh, the district has roughly 77,000 students across eight different degree and certificate programs. Olive Harvey has a slice of that, which is 4,900 students across six degree and seven certificate types. Um, so uh, I would say 54% of the completions that we obtain come from the associate's degree, with the associate of arts being the largest. When we deep dive into that for um, all of Harvey, um, we're closer to 33% um, or 40% of our students seeking basic certificates. And if you can 
really um, 63%, sorry, are of our completers obtaining basic certificates. So you can see there is a large interest of um, individuals who are looking for stackable credentials or honestly are just looking for a career change or um, to, to beef up their skills and get jobs. Next slide. So diving deep into what we're doing to address kind of equity in the cannabis industry. Um, first, we received a $1.5 million grant in, um, from ICCB, which we're really excited about in September. And among all the awarded goals that we're looking at and driving demand from African Americans and Latino populations and those who are unemployed and underemployed, we were really looking to launch a cannabis dispensary operations program in spring. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'd like to just talk about what's happening in the state of Illinois. It's really a historic moment um, that occurred with Illinois House Bill 1438 that legalized recreational cannabis. So the entire state is a bit of a frenzy in navigating a startup industry um, if with new legislative bills that are being passed that are really filling the gaps and defining parameters of the law. Okay, so what's the rub here? Um, they're creating jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities for black and brown residents. The unique thing that's happening that we're leveraging in this pipeline is social equity has literally been baked into the policies for dispensary ownership and empl employment. Really, there's law that, that calls out disproportionately individuals impacted by the war on drugs. So these are people who have drug convictions. Um, uh, the Illinois Black Caucus is also leading the way with even more progressive legislation around cannabis laws and social equity. And lastly, Illinois um, Senate Bill 2496 would actually waive petition, petition, petition fees for expungement requests. Um, so I believe that uh, if you go to the next slide, social equity is a huge piece that's happening. And I think you're seeing it very different in other states where individuals in academic programs like Olive Harvey are being rewarded for doubling down, tripling down on what this looks like. So in real practical, ter practical terms, understanding what's happening at the state level, um, on a frigid Valentine's Day evening, we um, enrolled roughly uh, 40 people in our inaugural cannabis dispensary operation course. And, um, we submitted this to um, HLC and ICCB, I'm sorry, for review and approval um, our last summer um, in uh, fall. So to actually see the fruition of this happen, um, along with alignment of this new legislation that launched in January 1st, is very exciting. Um, a, a, two weeks later, we started a second cohort, um, and that cohort really looks like 90% African Americans, 70 to 80% of those are individuals are looking for jobs or career changers, and 20 to 25% of the individuals are looking to create jobs through new, new ventures. And we've decided to use a cohort model um, to um, really double down on the importance of networking and relationship skills. Um, and this is by de facto happening as the cohort learns and grows together. That picture there is um, the 40 uh, students that attended on Valentine's Day and, um, in the classroom for our introduction to cannabis. Um, so this is how we're responding to what's happening because there's a lot going on and I know I'm feeding a lot of information, but I just want to express how Olive Harvey is managing the different pieces of this legislation and this Bergeronian um, uh, ecosystem of activities for cannabis. Um, first is the legislation. So Olive Harvey tracks legislation real time and then we evaluate the employment impact and work with our internal faculty sponsors to build around those future labor needs. So in right now we're looking at uh, developing a advanced certificate um, from seed to sale. And so we're working with looking at the legislation and when that legislation will come out and how we launch and really juxtaposition our program with the, job, the jobs that are gonna be coming down the pike. The second piece is social equity is baked into the policy, like I said. So we're really looking at 
the social equity pieces and doubling down on that with partnering with the city of Chicago and also Cabrini Green Legal Aid um, that's doing some awesome things with expungement. And a number of our students um, have previous drug incarcerations and convictions. Um, so Illinois dispensary operational success is nuanced. I can imagine that you, most people would say, well, why would they, you know, use individuals who, you know, are in the city of Chicago that have no experience and no education. They can just kind of like outsource that and fly people from Seattle or, or um, Denver to come work in dispensaries. So compliance here in Illinois, its flavor is heavily compliance oriented. So an experienced professional running a Seattle dispensary wouldn't able, be able to easily run one in Chicago. This actually levels the playing field for our students because employers like multi-state um, operator, operators like Cresco Labs are really training all of their new employees from the ground up and understanding the different areas of the work. Um, so we view this as an opportunity, right, to embed compliance into our SLOs and to make our students more employable. So we know that there's an anticipated growth, although we have 10 dispensaries that opened on January 1st and with the first day, I think there was over $2 million or $3 million in sales amongst the 10. Existing dispensaries are struggling, like they have to close their doors sometimes, they're just not able to handle the demand. And with the, another 72 plus opening come May 1st, there is going to be a huge demand for employment. And so we initially were looking at with this grant opening up capacity in the spring for 20 seats. We've actually blown up that number away to 80 seats and potentially 120 by the end of summer. Um, next. The market demand, customer demand is really at all time high. We have a, a valid industry that is looking for workers. So we are really doubling down on expanding our offerings that really juxtaposition ourselves to what the demand of the, of the workforce will look like. And secondly, uh, for you business junkies out there, um, OHC is really second to market with community, co community colleges and offering education opportunities within cannabis and really leading the charge in, um, in normalizing the conversations around cannabis and that this is a historical moment and that we should really be looking at this from a workforce lens and not um, a, another lens that uh, outside of uh, the discussion and the politics around it. So our comp competition really right now are hotel trainings and then CE offerings at other campuses like Chicago State and then medical cannabis program that's in the far north suburbs. So um, I like to say that we're the only thing in town, but actually we're the best thing in town. Next slide. So how are we doing this? What's our approach? So if you see that picture, that horrible selfie of mine, that is our mobile RV classroom. One challenge in uh, that we're having is about just removing all the barriers for everyone, including us to be able to reach individuals and for our students. So we took our mobile RV classroom um, where we conducted mass registrations at a city run event, um, along with doing a lot of social media out outreach, tons of info sessions on site. Um, over a one month period, we went from like 11 applications to over 625 applications. So the demand and interest is high. So we have a really good perfect storm of success, employer demand and citizen demand, right? So the only thing left is for us to execute. So our OHC approach is really providing accessibility to credit courses. And one of the biggest barriers to basic certificate programs is English 101. So we've removed that out of that and made it um, really accessible to be successful without needing English 101. Um, building capacity to fill demands, like I said, moving from 20 to 120 seats, developing a strong pipeline of students to escalate the advanced certificate. Um, so we are building and flying the plane at the same time and really working with the legislation to understand where the next thing and the next area of uh, workforce demands will be in this industry and then, and then developing a, a, an education program that supports that. 
Um, to say that we're partnering with employers is an understatement. Um, Cresco Labs has been an amazing partner and we're sitting side by side looking at how we develop employment part pipelines. So job fairs are really great, but oftentimes for us, they're also a really good marketing opportunity for employers, but they don't necessarily lead to large scale hiring. We're looking at commitments for interviews, resume reviews, pre-screenings, and that's what our leading and lagging indicators for hiring for us. And we're sitting down with them, looking at our curriculum for process improvement and continuous improvement of our program to see how we can beef up compliance um, related program learning and, and, and classroom and course uh, learning outcomes um, together. And we're doing that side by side to understanding what the employer needs. So when our individuals complete, they can hit the ground running. Also mentioning about creating cohorts of students. This is really a retention strategy too and a completion strategy. Um, as mentioned, we're staying ahead of the change in the policy and there's a Department of Ag pilot program that came out that will allow us to grow hemp on campus. And so students will have direct experience with the plant that is within the cannabinoid family, but not having plants on our campus as uh, federally cannabis is illegal and we do receive a uh, we do receive federal funds so how do we ensure that individuals are engaging and understanding the science behind it and we can do that with hemp plants um, as i mentioned we're heavily marketing through the radio in person um, and we're really trying to bring people on campus because we have a beautiful facility tdl facility where we are having our courses and it really kind of changes the perception of all of harvey and the far southeast side and then lastly we're engaging um, at all levels with that application process um, we have more interest than we have seats, but how can we develop continuing ed courses that really are an exploratory way for people to understand what their interests are? And then we can pipe those individuals who are like, you know what, the cannabis industry is for me. I feel comfortable with this. And then they can gradually enroll in our BC programs or stackable credentials like an AC program and in a future AAS program. So that's all of our best practices and um, thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much and it was really interesting to hear how um, you're working with your faculty to forecast a policy that's coming down the pike. Absolutely. Our faculty are our biggest champions and really the reason why we were able to be as far as we are with this. So a, a big shout out to OHC faculty and CCC's faculty, uh, district-wide faculty. So we are going to switch gears and um, spend a bit of time uh, answering some questions that we have for you. So let me. We have a few questions for our panelists. And um, you don't need to respond to these questions in any specific um, order. So um, I'm gonna ask the first question and any of you on the panel who wants to just go ahead and jump in and respond, <laughs> feel free to do so. Um, so our first question for you is what types of recruitment, and I know some of you mentioned this um, in your presentation, but um, if you could expand a little bit further, what types of recruitment and retention efforts have proven to be successful in matriculating racially minoritized groups in CTE programs and ultimately the, the workforce, right? Because the ultimate goal is um, um, successfully getting employment. Um, so if, if anyone wants to share some um, strategies that they've used um, for recru recruitment and retention for racially minoritized groups. I can pepper in, this is Daiya from all of Harvey. Um, for retention efforts, as I think Dr. Gonzalez and Amanda mentioned, is childcare is an issue for some of our students. It's the difference between being able to participate and complete or not. Um, so we're providing childcare stipends. Um, we provide free tuition, so scholarships, 
uh, book vouchers, and transportation cards. We found that that has been a very successful approach to um, retention and, um, and course completion. For marketing, um, I've found that we, when we go outside of our, our doors to where people are gravitating towards, which are conferences around the industry focus, um, going on the radio, doing social media uh, events, that really has garnered us to be successful in getting um, students interested in the program. So getting outside of your doors to meet students where they're at, we found to be super successful. Does anyone else have anything else to add on our panel in terms of recruitment and retention strategies? This is Amanda. I would just say that I actually would combine questions one and two here, which is to say the recruitment and retention strategies that I've seen work particularly well are, as folks have mentioned, where there is already a trusted community-based organization or other intermediary that folks are in contact with and that organization can serve as the on-ramp into the CTE program. Sometimes that on-ramp is a labor union or it is a labor management partnership. Sometimes it is a worker center, day labor center. Um, it was a really interesting pilot in California a couple of years ago uh, working with folks on green landscaping techniques. Um, and they were working with landscapers who were dropping into a day labor center and were intimidated about going to a community college campus. I think Dr. Gonzalez talked about this in her remarks. Um, and so having a trusted uh, worker center where they were already familiar and comfortable was really integral to getting them uh, engaged in a community college program. Similarly, in Westchester County, New York, uh, there was a program training in the healthcare sector um, that used Neighbors Link, which is a nonprofit community based organization in New York, um, as the kind of entry point for workers. So there's adult education programs, they can be good partners, there's community based nonprofits, there are labor unions, there are um, school districts, public libraries. Other, you know, entities that are either geographically accessible for the people you're trying to reach, are trusted environments, um, and that most of all have at least one ambassador or champion, somebody working there who really believes in and is enthusiastic about what you're trying to do. And that doesn't have to be the person with the fancy title, right? It could be um, that the receptionist at the YMCA is very on board with a career training program because she knows somebody else who graduated from your program. Um, and therefore the receptionist is, is your kind of champion among trying to recruit you know, YMCA members to, to connect to your CTE program. So I think thinking as broadly and expansively as possible about what are the institutions and the um, geographic locations that people already know and trust and then how do I build better and stronger and clearer on-ramps from those entities to my program? Thank you. And I actually have a follow-up question to the partnership questions and what partnerships are, are key, because I think all of you in your presentations um, identified um, partners that you're working with. Um, I know oftentimes community college leaders, you know, you, you wear many hats. <laughs> And so establishing these partnerships, it, you know, it, it's a lot of work. So what are su some suggestions in terms of, um, with all the other mini hats that you wear, <laughs> making time to establish these partnerships, um, but also, um, you know, what are some strategies that you use to make time to establish these partnerships, but also to hit the pavement and um, est establish partnerships? What are some strategies that you have for community college leaders um, that hold multiple roles, <laughs> are busy people? <laughs> Honestly, the most important thing I would say is write it into the budget. Mm -hmm. If you have a staff member's time that is paid for out of a budget, then it's not something that you're asking somebody to do as the 40th item on their to-do list. Um, and I know that's not always practical, right? Sometimes people don't have control over their own budgets or their budgets are very, you know, constrained. But I think the 
the most powerful thing you can do is actually pay for a person's time to build those partnerships. Um, the second most powerful thing you can do is to look where, you know, it's the old saying about water flows downhill, right? Look where the water is already flowing. Where are their partnerships already established? And is there a way that you can piggyback off of that partnership? Do you already have a child care partnership developed with community-based organization on your campus, even if you're not the one that developed that partnership? Um, okay, now can you go talk to that organization that's providing child care on campus and see if they might be interested in partnering on the CTE piece too? Maybe that'll work, maybe it won't, um, but it's a way to kind of piggyback off of existing partnerships without having to completely start from scratch. Thank you, Amanda. I can piggyback on that, on the realities of when that doesn't happen, but I 100% agree. So capacity is a real challenge for, uh, for us on this grant. Um, I am a department of one. So at the end of the day, we still have students who need to be served and we want them to be served with efficacy. So one strategy that we've used is really um, leveraging how we build our process into our existing processes. And really, it's the same life cycle of supporting students, but it's just making sure that those students are pipelined into our existing student services like student life cycle experience. I literally just had a meeting with um, our student services team to say, hey, I need to loosen myself up around enrollment right now so that I can focus on building partnerships and relationships. And we built out what that looks like and utilize individuals as like champions, if you will. Um, we're only talking about 200 students. So it's not like we have thousands of students and they're going through the, progress, uh, the process between spring and summer. So roughly managing 100 plus students at one given period of time and that has been successful. Regarding building relationships with partnerships, we make sure we have a presence all the time. And also we've developed a cannabis advisory committee. This committee has roughly 40 individuals on this and we've leveraged our relationships at the city of Chicago and at CCC district office with our president Hollingsworth and our chancellor um, uh, uh, Juan and we are getting uh, uh, referrals for, for partners. And once we get those introductions, we convert those to in-person meetings right away. Um, I, I see the excitement once they get on campus and, they, and we're speaking their language, meaning that we have individuals who can be employed in their businesses and operations. That conversation immediately turns into a positive one. And then we convert that to what are actual tangible um, takeaways and what are tangible deliverables. So that might be, um, we want you to review our curriculum or we want you to come on site and interview. So we're ready to go, if you will, with our talking points on what we need. So I think just being super agile, be willing to meet them in person, bringing them on campus, and then identifying what their pain points are around workforce. Anything else to add from our panelists about partnerships? And tips for engaging in partnerships, initiating partnerships? Um, uh, this is Melissa Gonzalez. I'll just share that we have partnership, we have some of the community-based organizations housed in our buildings. We have a couple already. We even have uh, uh, an office, uh, two offices, uh, one for an elected official as well. And so, I mean, that makes it really easy. I know that space is limited, but when you have uh, these resources on campus, it, it makes it easy to do a lot of things together, apply for grants, have community meetings together, um, just like that state rep that I showed you. I mean, she is housed in our campus. So she's, everything she, has, she does um, is we're included. And so, you know, we're hoping that through those uh, partnerships and engagement that people will feel more comfortable once they come to an event, you know, they come to a job fair at a campus, that they're going to follow up and, hey, well, there's some English classes that I should be taking or that I could take here that I didn't know about. And um, we also have, um, you know, uh, I have like a community update conversations with the community 
where we invite all our partners um, in, in the area. Um, I'm having one tomorrow. And also the, the chancellor through the whole system has a state of the college, you know, event that, you know, they invite all, everybody from all over uh, the Houston area. But I have one specifically for our college where we invite them and share with them all the great things we're doing. And that's how uh, we get to meet some of the key players and, and some of the uh, things that uh, they know what we're doing. And, and for a lot of people, sometimes the first time they hear about some of the things that we're doing. I mean, we're, we're doing things really outside the, the normal um, as, as far as what they thought was normal. And so um, they're, they want to be involved. So we, you know, we partner on grants, we partner on events, we partner on initiatives, and we partner in uh, transportation. Um, our commissioner who is housed in one of our campuses, um, he provides buses whenever we have events because our high schools, our school districts are very you know, it's cost $250 to rent a bus and it's hard for them to provide that. So we provide a bus for them through our uh, elected officials. So again, it's just, I mean, being more engaged. I know, and you're right, there's so much time, there's so many things going on, but for me, it's very important to stay engaged and we do it through, um, like I mentioned, uh, community events, um, having them come to you know, our campus. We use our campus a lot for a lot of events. That's one thing that whenever I talk to our partners, hey, we have conference space, we have meeting rooms, we have, um, you know, you wanna hold your community meeting. We have a council member who's using our facility tonight. And I asked them, all I'm asking is free for you, but uh, can I speak five minutes before? So I can just say a little bit about our college and college and then just share uh, some flyers and some things to the community. So, I mean, of course they say yes. So, I mean, and so it's again, just engaging and, um, and having them have events at your place that really helps out as well. Thank you. And so um, each of you in your presentations um, talked about shared innovative ways in which you're um, trying to garner resources um, for your students. But I'm just wondering if there's anything else um, that you didn't get a chance to share in terms of what additional resources are needed to increase opportunities for and ensure the success for racially minoritized groups in terms of CTE programs and workforce development, but also in terms of um, supporting students in getting a job um, and securing um, employment. So if there's any other resources that you didn't get a chance to share um, that you would like to share with us. This is Amanda. I think the one thing I would mention is the more diverse your instructor workforce, the more uh, your students will engage and persist. And there's plenty of good research to back that up. People need to see themselves reflected in the people with expertise and the people running the program. And so being as creative as you can in your recruitment of teachers, um, whether that's the full-time teacher for the class or an industry leader who comes in as a guest teacher, um, is really powerful and important, and um, I think really should not be overlooked. Thank you. This is Dehia. I think that, um, you know, we're all very lucky to be listening to this webinar today and have the privilege to say, hey, if we create these education programs and we remove barriers and pay for child care and transportation and um, they complete it, everything's going to be perfect. They're going to get a job and they're going to live happily ever after. Um, I think that's just being kind of Pollyanna about it. I think we should um, one way to service and provide resources is think about the whole student and how important it is that some of these individuals, as we kind of um, in our profession see so much information about social emotional awareness, personal wellness, personal sustainability, meditation, being aware of like your surroundings and how you might be perceived. Um, I think this has been left out for um, this particular population. So really making sure that you embed the whole individual. And so many of them are have a lot of anxiety. They are easily triggered, right? Because they're worried about bills. They're worried about former incarceration. They're worried about a transition of a career, the running the gamut. They're worried about child care. How can we support these individuals through programming and professional development that focuses on self-care 
um, um, self-management, social emotional awareness. And I think that is a really missing piece that will help with employment and really retention with employment too. And we're looking at that. Thank you. Anything else from our panelists? Okay. Well, I see that we still have some um, participants who have still um, st stayed logged in. <laughs> so they're obviously very intrigued um, by the discussion and your presentations. So um, we'll spend a couple of minutes. Um, if there's any um, questions from our audience, if you could please use the chat function. To type in your questions. But we do have a, a few minutes left um, for questions from our audience. Via the chat function. And maybe the presentations were so amazing that we answered all your questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I know um, it was a lot of information, really rich information, um, and I'm sure you can see why um, we invited our three panelists um, based on the work that they're doing um, in the field. Um, I myself have learned a lot. Amanda, did you have a question? Uh, your microphone was turned on. I don't know if you you wanted to ask something or had a comment. No, I just want to thank my co-presenters and thank you. This has been a great conversation. Yes, it has. It has. It definitely has. I mean, I have, like I said again, um, we have all learned so much. And if there isn't any um, questions from the audience, um, I mean, well, one, one of the um, audience members, thanks for a great presentation and information. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so if your colleagues um, were unable to um, log into this uh, webinar, we will be um, posting it um, on our OCCRL web website as part of our CT equity um, webinar series. Um, we will have uh, future webinars related to CT and equity. Um, I think our next webinar is specific to um, working with industry partners and talking about racial equity, but just wanted to um, share with you our website. Um, and we, I, I promise you, we will have this webinar um, posted very quickly. <laughs> we won't waste any time um, posting this really rich information from our three panelists. Um, I cannot thank you enough um, from our panelists for taking the time to put together your presentations. I know all three of you are very, very busy people. Um, it's evident by your presentations that you are doing great things. Um, wear many hats, um, are quite busy people. So I just can't thank you enough for um, taking the time this hour and a half today to um, talk with us um, and share what you're, the work that you're doing. Um, and I, as I said before, we have all learned so, 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 so much. Um, thank you, Anjali. Thank you to the panelists. We, uh, Olive Harvey really appreciates it. Yes, yes. Well, if there isn't any other questions, um, please uh, stay tuned to your email. Um, if, you're, if you're signed up with the OCCRL listserv, 
um, be on the lookout um, for information um, about our future webinars on CTE and equity. Um, also, please follow us on Twitter um, where we'll give um, notices um, out through Twitter. Um, I know also um, ICCB, the um, Illinois Community College Board, um, they have been sharing out um, information about our webinars. Um, so also appreciate to those of you who took the time from your day to um, register and um, to listen to this webinar until the end. So um, other than that, I don't have anything else for you this afternoon. I just wanted to say thank you again and um, be on the lookout um, on our website uh, for the posting of this webinar. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to Francina and um, Devin and um, Angel for helping um, coordinate and put together this webinar. Thanks, take care. Have Thank a good you. afternoon, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>